the first property that Xerox bought here in Webster was my dad's 60-acre farm. Well, we used to raise hogs out here on the field where the parking lot is now. See, that was uh, approximately 10 years ago. He has never been back to the farm here since they built it. Uh, someday when he comes back, he's going to have a surprise of his life. One more time, fellas. Let's get that thing up there now. We pull it over. That's better. Now somebody lift. One more. Temperature in downtown Rochester is 78 degrees and clear. And now the news. Out in Webster, the Xerox Corporation reports an expected attendance of 5,000 shareholders when this year's annual meeting is convened this Thursday by President Joseph Wilson. In Ithaca, Cornell students... What's the forecast for the weather tomorrow? I haven't Go checked. Go like this? Yeah. Jeez, I wish yeah. you would say just like this. It's not too yeah. hot. And, uh, this is perfect. Yeah. So we'll Let's keep our good. fingers crossed. I've heard this one of the biggest tents in the country, is that right? Uh, it's the largest tent in the country for rent. Is it really? Yeah. No kidding. Uh, Barnum and Bailey's tent was bigger. Yeah. But uh, that is uh, uh, not in uh, use anymore. It's quite a job you did. Yeah, some job. Terrific. It looks beautiful. Take a cyclone to take this down. We don't want any of them. Did you have to see what happened at the communication satellite meeting? Wilma Sauce and Lewis Gilbert uh, were both ejected from the meeting. Uh, I guess in the case of Mrs. Sauce, they had to pick her up and carry her out. Last year, they held that meeting up for nine hours. I think we had one pair of shareholders show up this morning. Today? Yeah. Showed up five minutes to 11. For, for the meeting? They're ready. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so, there's always one guy yeah. that doesn't get the word, you know. I know. <laughs> I had a couple of them call me. One woman came back from a doll show in Philadelphia in order to be at the meeting on Tuesday. Oh boy. She was a little bit cross. <laughs> I said, well, I'm sorry, but the date was set by the bylaws a good many years ago. Well, I think I'll scoot along. See you tomorrow. See you yeah. tomorrow. Okay. Bye-bye, boys. So you'd like one or two tickets? One ticket. Well, why don't you plan on picking it up at the uh, meeting site, and uh, we'll have it ready for you on arrival. The menu is the roast sirloin of beef, spiced turkey, hot German potato salad, relishes, coffee, and French pastries. The machines are plugged in, they're ready to go, and we want the demo gals and the pitchmen to work out their routines together. Do answer questions fully. Smile, be very happy to answer the question without giving classified information. Gentlemen, I'm Ken Sluter, the security officer for Xerox Corporation. I want you to take a good look at me. Remember my face and remember I meant my name. The name is Ken Sluter. Ken, where do we stand on security? Well, we'll have a total of 21 guards available. I'll have four guard debts 
in the building. Are all the guards going to be in uniform? Oh, yes. There has to be some kind of identification. I don't like the idea of a, uh, of a Marine Corps type of uniform on these things, but they must have some form of identification as guards, because if they do have to forcibly eject one of these tomatoes, uh, they've got to know that they're being handled by professionals. As long as they just don't look like uh, black shirts, you know, <laughs> stormtroopers. Should it become necessary to evict a female stockholder, only the matrons will touch the female stockholder. They again will use the minimum amount of force necessary to evict the stockholder. It is anticipated that if a woman has to be evicted, she may struggle, kick, bite, scream, or whatever. I expect you to defend yourselves and each other by using your bodies, but you may not strike our guests with your fists or hands. I was exceedingly anxious to come to this meeting. I don't uh, like the development of the circus angle because it should be business. I have never been to a stockholders meeting. That's why I came. So I think the stockholders can express their beliefs and tell management whether they're doing right or wrong. One thing that leads me out here is to see and hear the people that are going to agitate at this meeting. It's like anything else. If, you, if somebody keeps jamming you about something, you're going to try to have your business in order. Everything they advance is uh, picayune. The only thing that was uh, seemed to be here for was disruption. They're, they're serving a purpose. They're stimulating management. They're keeping him on the ball. The principle of any democratic meeting is to get up and express your views. I'm not a large stockholder. I own five shares, and one is my custodian. I'm 13 years old, and if I change this, what it's all about. Well, I think a meeting like this is necessary for the shareholders to know what is going on and to have a voice in what they think should be going on. Stock's going up, so that's enough for me. Never heard of Lewis Gill. You never, you never read the newspapers. You never read the Rochester Times Democrat, obviously. No. And you never heard of the Comstat annual meeting? No, it's not really Comstat. Well, and, and you didn't see, and don't you know who Lewis Gilbert is? No, we don't know. Lewis Gilbert is, we represent the stockholders. I am Lewis Gilbert. Uh, we are representing 10,000 shares of, of, of Xerox stock to represent independent viewpoints and to ask questions. Questions are asked for two purposes. The primary purpose of asking questions is information. But in addition, one makes statements about what one dislikes. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the other things that, that I need to be briefed on very clearly is, is uh, whether we are governed by any set of parliamentary rules or not, or do I have more freedom than that to conduct the meeting? Well, we've looked into that pretty carefully, and actually there are no, there are no statutes or rules of the SEC. Uh, or the bylaws of the company which require you to follow Robert's rules of order. As long as the stockholder has a reasonable amount of time allotted to him, this is all that he can expect. If there is any standard for procedure of meeting this kind, it is Robert's. And no as question. soon as you deviate, somebody gets up and says, why the hell aren't you following the sure. I apologize for being a little late, but we heard that many people who'd come a long, long way were en route, and we hated to deprive them of the excitement of this meeting. I hope you'll forgive us. One announcement before we begin. Uh, I'm very happy to tell you that the mayor of Webster, Milton R. Case, has called this Xerox Day, and you are all now honorary citizens of the village of Webster, New York. <laughs> I'm no case, the mayor of the village of Webster. I have this uh, pharmacy here that uh, I have been operating for the past 28 years. And uh, I have seen many changes take place. Big changes in industry, without a doubt. And industry brought growth in uh, population. And because of one, you have the other. And I believe that a stockholders meeting is hardly any different than any political meeting. I think if we did away with big stockholders meetings that we would be doing away with part of the feeling and American way of life. I'd like to call the meeting to order.
We're going to be recording the proceedings on tape. Hope you'll all bear that in mind as you speak. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce Kent Damon, who is vice president in charge of our finance and also secretary of the company to uh, speak about the convening of the meeting. The board of directors fixed 3.30 p.m. April 2nd, 1965 as the date and time as of which shareholders entitled to notice of and to vote at the meeting should be determined. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my name is Lois Gilbert. I am representing 10,000 shares and I have the pleasure of rising to make two comments. We are all delighted at the size of the meeting here today. And my second point is, were there any bylaw changes made by the board during the year? Mr. Gilbert, I'd be very glad to have your question relevant to the notice of the meeting. I'll let no other subjects discussed at this time. There were no bylaw changes during the year, Mr. Gilbert. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Ah, yes, Miss Davis. Oh, no, please, please, please. My name is Evelyn Y. Davis of New York City. I am protesting that this meeting is being held in Xerox City instead of New York City. The largest, uh, I don't have a, mi I don't have a um, microphone here. Is there, uh... <laughs> where is the microphone, the traveling microphone? Can everyone hear me now? Yeah. We're turning up the volume. <laughs> Turn up the volume. <laughs> you think that's necessary with my voice? Uh, like I say, I'm protesting that the meeting is being held here in Xerox City instead of New York City. So I hope in future years, we will meet there. We will be very happy to consider this point carefully next year, Miss Davis. Uh-huh, thank uh, you. And Mr. Chairman, there has been an omission on the, on the agenda. You failed to include my resolution, the most important thing of this meeting. Mrs. Davis, uh, this uh, was perhaps an inadvertent omission. It was our impression that because we were not sure that you would be here, and therefore the resolution might oh. not be put to the meeting. <laughs> uh, your resolution will come before the meeting. Before your address. Oh, yeah, my address is going to be so brief you won't know whether it came before yeah, or after. <laughs> All right, thank you. I would like to appoint Raymond Schlegel and Edward Klingler, inspectors of election. Inspectors, are you ready? There is approximately 90% plus represented at the meeting by in person and by proxy at the present time. Thank, Thank you very you. much. That's a quorum. The meeting is convened. First, I'd like to introduce Sal Linowitz, chairman of the executive committee, Peter McCullough, executive vice president, and Dr. John Dessauer, who's head of our research and engineering. In brief, I'm able to say to you today that our patent position is a satisfying one. Graphic communications are the threshold of changing our life to a degree not yet comprehended by most people. The 813, without any qualification, has been an outstanding success. It's an unusual thing that a company whose market value in 1946 was two and a half million dollars had day before yesterday a market value of almost two billion eight hundred thousand. We are now planning to establish subsidiaries shortly in Peru, Colombia, Costa Rica, Panama, and Uruguay. We're now going to get along with the business of the meeting. We have two resolutions relating to the election of directors and to the election of auditors. Now, Ms. Davis, I wish to read into the record a brief article called Xerox Scoping with Wrong Way Voters. Evelyn Y. Davis of New York City, author of a resolution to restrict Xerox Corporation's gifts to education and charity, is being supported by people who didn't mean to do it. The company is calling on a modest scale to ask large shareholders who voted for the resolution whether they intended to do so. Now, Mr. Chairman, I have several things to ask, and I hope in the future the proxy rules will be amended that such nonsense won't be permitted anymore.
Johnny Boyle. Uh, no. Mrs. Mrs. Davis, may I just say a word at the yes. moment? I think it would be unfair to leave this point this way. Uh, it's, it's perfectly legal for us to go to people and talk uh, in any way we see fit about the way we'd like to have them vote. And, and uh, while if we were going to write to them again, we would have to get the written material approved by the SEC. But we, we can do anything we want. Now, we didn't do that. What we, we found out was that a number of mistakes had been made, so we went to a few people who had some shares, and, and, and if they said that they had made a mistake, we gave them a chance to vote again. If they said they voted as they intended, that was that. I wouldn't want any of you to get the impression that any coercion or undercover thing happened, and this is all before the SEC. Now, whether this was a wise policy or not is something else again. Uh, after all, we're way off up here in the country, and perhaps we'll learn to do things better in the future. Exactly, exactly. Your company gave away $513,000 of your money to charity, money which belongs to you. Mark your proxy for this resolution, otherwise it's automatically cast again. I think I'm going to make a rather long answer. It doesn't take a very uh, perceptive person to know now that this corporation has decided that a great opportunity is open for it in the field of education and the field of industrial training, of teaching people throughout the world how to get knowledge more readily, more cheaply, more, uh, we'll call it what you will. This policy of ours is in our own enlightened self-interest. And we think that any limitation on our capacity to use a few hundred thousand dollars plus or minus one way or another here, when you permit us to spend $30 million in research and engineering, is ridiculous. Because I think it would completely frustrate what is going to be, we believe, the most important program that we have ever undertaken yet. And therefore, I would say that there is nothing that we more wholeheartedly oppose than this particular resolution. As a shareholder, I feel very strongly that a corporation has a civic responsibility. Therefore, I am very much in favor of contributions to research, to educational institutions, and to anything that is going to benefit mankind at large. I feel that when education and industry are too closely aligned, that education can suffer. Mm -hmm. And I'm worried about the future of education because of this alignment. I don't think education has any right to be educating for business. Education must educate for citizenship. Everybody with me? Hairs in the center. Black olives. Stuffed olives, fill it in with cauliflower, and your pickles right next to the black olives. Everybody with me? Who's working on pears? I am. Pears first. Oh, the pears first? Put your pears in the center. Then the girl on the right will be putting in her olives. The girl on the left will be putting in the green olives. Then the plate can go down for the pickles. Actually, I think it might be simpler this way. Start here, please, with the pears. All right, bring the cauliflower down here. Cauliflower down at the end. And then the completed relish dishes onto the sheet pan and on out to the dining tent. And if they're not perfect, they won't pass inspection. Empty this plate. It's no good. We're ready now for general questions. Number three. We'd like to compliment you on the 813 machine. We do mention, however, that this machine is slower than some of our competitors. Is it possible that something will be done about this? I read in the prospectus of BASIC that they were losing money heavily, and it seemed to continue to lose even more. Why did we buy a company which has been losing money so steadily? I was wondering if, the, if you could explain the reasoning behind the management decision to sell the 813 copier as opposed to just leasing it out. Instead of saying copy this for me, people say Xerox it for me. What are we doing so that this does not go into the common usage? In the, our courthouse, I see a uh, coin-operated copier 
Is that anything we're concerned with, and have we explored the possibility of operation like that? You used on page 15 the word CAM, the word CAM. What is a CAM? A CAM, in this case, is an irregularly shaped machine part which can program a series of actions by a machine. See, now, now I understand it. So if we would have a glossary uh, in the future years when you want to use technical times, we'll appreciate No, Lewis, that's a very excellent thought, and we've already made a note of it. Thank you, sir. I'd like to have Mr. Schlegel, his inspector of election, report about the resolutions. With respect to the election of directors of the company for the ensuing year, votes representing 18... Thank you. The directors are elected. Pete Marwick has been elected uh, independent auditors, and the uh, Mrs. Davis resolution has been defeated. Before we adjourn, I'd like to say a few words to all of you. you you've been patient, you've been devoted, you've been loyal, you've been enthusiastic, and I'd like to have my associates along here rise and let's applaud the stockholders. The meeting is adjourned. There will be luncheon served in the luncheon tents. Following lunch, we hope that those who are interested will enjoy a tour of our machine manufacturing plant. After hearing the discussion here from that woman, I'm ready to eat. She's got me tired out listening to her. Well, those are five desserts left over, split into about 15 pieces for us all. Equal shareholders. <laughs> I think some of the discussion was a little unnecessary. I think today we had a superb example of democracy in action. This was an example of the way to conduct the meeting. <laughs> I think of a stockholders meeting in the tent is just a little ridiculous. It looks like a traveling carnival. Oh, I just love it. I'm having marvelous stuff. It's fun. It's different. Every Xerox meeting is a wonderful thing. I may be a little biased because I made a million dollars on the stock. On a $3,000 investment. I made $1 million on a $3,000 investment.